biggest thing I, I talk about, whether it be cadence, but not necessarily cadence, but so it's not what their cadence is, it's how they get their cadence around. You do change cadence and you see that their form doesn't change. It's because they've just adopted a quicker, similar pattern, right? What do you do when you have a runner that you're analyzing and you notice a little bit of everything? Knees are collapsing in, the foot's landing far in front of the body, their arms are all over the place, their ponytail's bouncing around. And that person asks you, well, how's my running? In this week, we're gonna talk about the running gait categories and how we use those to both prioritize what we're doing and communicate what's really going on to the runner. So I hope you enjoy this episode. Lots of great things as we go into the five running gait categories. Hey everybody, Doug Adams here with Scott Greenberg from Run DNA Podcast. And excited to talk today. We are, uh, Scott and I have a lot of conversations, but sometimes I'm interviewing Scott about stuff that he has a lot of experience with, and sometimes Scott's interviewing me. And this is something we both have a lot of experience with, uh, but Scott is going to interview me a bit, so I'll be uh, in the hot seat a little bit about the gate categories. These gate categories are something that's essential to what we do at Run DNA, and I think something that we really want to get the message out because this is something we want gate analysis to be a crucial part of the rehab process and the sports performance process, and we want to get this information out so that people can use it. So, Scott, I'll hand it over to you, and, and we can start talking about the categories and maybe even dive deeper into one. All right, so so great, yeah. So I love talking about this this topic because again. You know, when I first came on to run DNA, didn't know much about the categories that you kind of had in your I in your brain as to like what they were and why they were. And, you know, you and I kind of talked a lot and, and developed some of these. And um, so so in your opinion, in your in your eyes, like why did this come about and like how did you decide what the categories were going to be? Yeah, I, we're not the first to use categories like this, and you'll probably see these categories even in other places. And I go back to a lot of times I joke that I'm not always the smartest guy in the room. A lot of times I have enough understanding to understand science and literature and, and really die and, and get into that, but I need it simplified because I'm just dumb enough that I really need to understand it and put it in terms that really make sense to me. So the way I really like to do that is through these categories. And I think that that really came about is that not saying you have to be dumb to use the categories, but it, it dumb, dumbs it down a little bit and makes it easier to comprehend because it's very overwhelming, with, especially if you're newer to working with runners or any sport that involves running, because as much as these categories specifically are a lot of geared towards endurance runners, they are universal for any sport that runs. And I think it's really important that we simplify the complexity of running gait so that we can actually understand what's our top priority. So the idea with these is if you do find it confusing that you look at somebody on a treadmill and you're saying, well, their arms are kind of swinging back and forth and their knees are touching together and it looks like their foot's landing pretty far out in front of them and they're pretty upright when they run. That could be pretty intimidating to try to explain all that for your own clinical hypothesis, but then trying to convey that to the patient is also really hard. So that's where the category, that's that's the reason that the categories exist, um, because we needed a common language, both between medical and fitness providers and between those providers and their patients. Mm -hmm. So, so in essence, we're creating a model, right? And, you know, in, in the world when, you, when models are not, are not always identical to real, the real world, right? So a model is imperfect in a lot of ways. And the models that, that Doug and, and I kind of came up with are, are there to, again, uh, help simplify very complex issues. Right. And so let's, let's go, first of all, let's talk about what the five categories are. And mm -hmm. then knowing that a model is an oversimplification oftentimes of a real world situation, what have you noticed about those times where a person doesn't necessarily fit perfectly into one category and maybe hits on two or three of those categories? What, what's your thought on, on that process? 
Yeah, so uh, the categories first, right? Uh, so the five categories, there's five main categories, and then there's some subcategories that we teach in our level two course. But for today, let's just talk about the five categories. So we are going to see overstriders. We're going to see our collapsers. We're going to see our bouncers, our weavers, and our glued amnesiacs. So those are our five categories that we commonly refer to. And you're exactly right. It's not that people only fit into one or everyone fits neatly into exactly one. And a lot of it is based off of evidence. So these aren't just five random categories that you and I were just like, oh, what should we, what's a catchy name? Glute amnesiac sounds fun. Let's just go with that. It was really based off of looking at the evidence and Scott and I both probably just read running research all the time, stay up to on, on date on it here. I, you know, reading multiple articles all the time with that. And I started noticing some of those patterns of, okay, this article talked about high ground reaction forces. And this one talked about moment arms and torque. And this one talked about joint position. And, and I think that that was pretty complex, but we started to notice patterns and some of that stuff. And, and that's when we started to say, well, this one really fits into a group of people that we call overstriders because we're seeing high forces and we're seeing that um, their, uh, pos their posture and their position is off at, at initial contact phase. So we started to say, well, what are the things that contribute to running injuries? When do they happen and what, how we can group them together? Because the idea is, is that the categories provides prioritization more so than anything, because you could have somebody that fits into all of the categories. I think I fit in all the categories at some point, and maybe even the spectrum of a run, like I start off pretty good and as I fatigue, maybe we start to see some changes in my mechanics. But um, I, I do think, it's meant to be a way to say, this is a, the category I want to start with. But realizing that just because I say somebody's an overstrider doesn't mean that they also don't have collapsing mechanics or weaving mechanics or they're a glued amnesiac as well. Okay. So if 90% of the, the, of the people or 90% of the time people fall in multiple categories, why, why are we using categories at all, right? So what, what would yeah. be your thought process there? Yeah, because it, it is interesting. And um, I think it goes back to what we were saying. We can dive in a little bit more about clinical hypothesis for the clinician side is really trying to relate what we're seeing with their specific movement pattern and how that contributes to the specific pain or pathology that we're really treating this person for. Mm -hmm. On the runner side, though, I do think it's really helpful for them to also have a clear communication about what they're experiencing and what's being noticed as well. So I think really it's communication because we're we're not saying that it's just one or that it's perfectly into this category, but you're most likely exhibiting some overstrider tendencies. And this is what we want to focus on. So it helps the clinician prioritize and it helps the athlete to understand really what they should be focusing on and get a grasp on it because i i'm sure you've seen this scott too right you get some runners or any patients that come in and they're just focused on what is it why did this happen why am i getting injured with this and as soon as they find out some kind of reason they seem to almost be 50% better right then and there. Like, oh, this is overstriding. And Scott told me that I can fix my form with this. I'm going to get better. And then they're bought in and they're going to get better results with that. So I think prioritization and communication are probably the two biggest reasons why I think categories really help both parties involved with running injuries. I agree with that. And, and to dive a little bit deeper into that, you know, it's that common language that we can kind of talk about. So when I say, you know, so-and-so is an overstrider, mm -hmm. um, you and I both know kind of, and most people will know what that kind of looks like. If yes. somebody is a weaver, we kind of have an idea of what that person is going to look like. If somebody is a bouncer, we know what that, that, that running mechanic style is going to look like. So I think we can start to talk more common common terms and kind of create that clear, concise picture 
of what that particular movement pattern looks like. So I think there's value in that too, not just from the patient understanding, but even communicating between different clinicians and professionals. Yeah, in my own clinic, right, we specialize in treating endurance athletes. So when I'm traveling and uh, on the road and I've got some of my patients that are seeing some of my other providers here, it's very easy to say, hey, I'm working with this person and they're an overstrider and on the runner readiness assessment, we're working on squat ankle dorsiflexion. Okay. That's all that needs to be said versus, well, this is what's happening. That's what's happening. I know it's a little bit of that. A little bit. It's much more efficient that way. Mm -hmm. So out of the categories you mentioned, which one's the most, most common? Mm. Actually, I, I think this one's actually probably a softball question because we do see very commonly overstriding. I think that is by far the number one thing that we're going to see is people overstriding. And there's probably a few reasons why that is, but that's definitely the most common. Okay. And if somebody is an overstrider, what are some of the things you would likely, number one, see and kind of how you would how you would deal with that once you've saw it? Yeah, overstriding, the nice thing is it, it, it's the most common, but we do have to ask ourselves, is it the most common because it's the easiest to identify as well too? This one I really like because this is something that you don't need a whole lot for. You can just look at somebody from the side. You can use some slow motion camera. You can look and there's easy, I think it was Salsa 2016, the Malleolar line. So there's just a really simple way to identify it where if you draw a line from somebody's lateral malleolus, the outside of their ankle. And if you draw it straight vertically, and if that line is in front of their knee, there's some overstriding. Now, there's some complexity to that, right? I, I think that when we talk about overstriding and we talk about the subcategories, there's different types of overstriders. There's not just one type of overstrider. There's people that overstride for different reasons. And that's what we go into a lot in our level two course. But there's other factors that contribute to why people land in that position. Because somebody could still have that malleolar line, but maybe they're landing pretty close underneath of their body. And it's just a position of how they're landing. It's their mechanics of their hip and their knee and their ankle, how those are interacting there. So it is, and when we were designing these, it was a little hard to draw a line in the sand and say, hey, if you do this, you're an overstrider. Now, I think the nice thing about overstriders, you can be simplistic about it and you can say, all right, here is an overstrider. I drew that line, the foot's in front of the knee, you're overstriding. Mm -hmm. But then you can go on the other end of the spectrum now and you can start to say, okay, here is the position of the knee, here is the position of the shin, here's the position of the foot, here's a strike from center of mass, here is the hip separation angle. Here are other things that we are seeing that we're identifying. And a lot of that we measure in 3D, but some of that can be measured in 2D as well because of the sagittal plane nature of it. And we can start to see exactly what we're, we're identifying and we can get a lot more detailed about this overstrider where it's not just your foot's landing in front of your body. Mm -hmm. It's why is your foot landing in front of your body? Mm -hmm. So I'm going to lead the next question. I know the answer because we talk about this all the time, but yeah. just so our listeners can hear. So somebody has multiple categories, right? And mm -hmm. they don't they don't fit into that perfect box. What what? How do you decide what category to address first, and why? So I think there, again, there's kind of a simple and a complex answer to that question. The the simple answer to that question is we have come up with uh, some hierarchical ways of looking at it. Um, and I think we teach a nice, a simplified way of doing it, but the, the why behind the categories and the order that they're in is really starting to match up what we think is contributing to this particular injury. Is it a high force type injury or is it a forces are in the wrong place type injury? I think that's maybe an oversimplification, but I think it's a nice way to think about it is, are the forces really high and our body can't absorb them? Or are the forces in a 
direction or on a structure that's not really designed for handling forces in the way that we're putting them on our body. Mm -hmm. So I think that we tend to see that overstriding is the one that we're going to address first, because that is the one that has its characteristic of high forces. Mm -hmm. And it is one of those that we see because of, you know, a little uh, nerd alert here, but because of the distance that our foot is landing in front of us, it is increasing the torque that is occurring on the body. And that is putting a lot of stress on the body. And therefore, we might see that if you're overstriding, you could be collapsing too. And you could be a bit of a glute amnesiac, or you could be weaving because your body is trying to find some way to accommodate for those high forces. So that's one I'm going to go to a lot of times first. And, and when I do my 2D analysis, you know, along the same lines, I tend to predominantly most do most of my assessment looking at sagittal plane mechanics, mm -hmm. things such as, you know, contact relative to center of mass foot inclination angle, tibial inclination angle, knee flexion at initial contact, hip separation angle, trunk lean, all those things are sagittal plane kind of mechanics that I view from the side. And yeah. I personally believe, as I think you do as well, that by addressing a lot of those type of issues via using, you know, uh, low hanging fruit approaches, such as cadence being a very easy one, a lot of the other things that we typically tend to see that you would normally appreciate from either looking at the athlete running from behind or from in front, um, oftentimes take care of themselves. You know, for example, just to speak to what you were talking about, if somebody is on the ground for a prolonged period of time, that may be related to overstriding. Mm -hmm. um, and as a result of being on the ground for a long period of time, the way our body deals with absorption of stress is by pronating. The way we pronate isn't just a foot and ankle issue. It's a lower leg and even, you know, body issue when you really think about it. So pronation, tibial internal rotation, knee goes into that dynamic valgus, femur goes into internal rotation, hip, hip, you know, obviously becomes a drops and, and you get this, this whole pattern that, that kind of takes place. And I feel that if you can limit the amount of time the person is in contact with the ground, again, observed in the sagittal plane. Yeah, a lot of the frontal plane mechanics, such as well, we'll call it a frontal plane mechanics, but it's really more of a transverse. But we'll call it you know frontal plane mechanics, such as you know pronation or knee valgus, what have you, oftentimes dissipates as you decrease that stance time. So again, you find patterns that tend to work for you that oftentimes lead you down the correct path to deal with other other things. But there are certain things that are number one very easily addressed that will oftentimes facilitate kind of taking back that onion peel and kind of getting to the core of the problem. Yeah. And that's, you know, our goal at Run DNA is really getting everyone doing gait analysis. And one of the facts that I really like about gait retraining is that it only takes 10% of a reduction in stress to let you run twice as far before your body breaks down. That's really easy to do. And in somebody like an overstrider, that's very obtainable. So exactly what you're, you're talking about, and you brought up cadence, right? Because that is one of the strategies that a lot of people will use. And what I found in doing cadence, because do, using the 3D, we're able to see how cadence really impacts people's form. And what we've seen is that it often helps people to reduce how far they're landing out in front of their body but it doesn't very often actually change their mechanics of what they look like when they get there. So it's still a beneficial act activity to do with them. You can still use cadence and it can be really helpful because you are having somebody land closer to their center of mass. So the moment arm isn't as far and the forces aren't going to be high, which is great. But what we found is that about 20% of the time, they'll change their form positively, but the other 80% of the time, their form is still what it is. I'm so, going to dive into that for a second. When you say when you yeah. with their form, so if they're landing yeah. closer to the center of mass, I'll push back a little bit just because, you know, we have to have a little, a little debate. If they're no, landing yeah, closer to their center of mass, their form has changed. 
elements of it, but not everything. And this is where not everything, having, but but their form everything. has changed. There's been a change in their form. Right. But everyone can have a different uh, strategy of how to get there. And what we're seeing is that about one in five times people adopt a preferred strategy to get there. Four to five times, it's not necessarily a preferred strategy. And to give a little more context, since we're getting nerdy with it here, is what we will often not see change with cadence are things like the tibial inclination angle, where they'll still be in that position. And that is something that is a uh, does have an impact, right? We're, we're really seeing that that's kind of it sounds if if you're not familiar with the the metric the tibial inclination angle is basically the angle of the shin relative to the vertical so you want your shin to be almost vertical aligned with there because then your foot's going to be stopped at, at initial, at initial, initial contact. contact yep you want to be in that position for endurance type activities middle distance type running there and, and beyond um so you want that position but what we see with just doing just cadence a lot of times, what we'll see is that they'll still be off of vertical and be in like a flex type position that way. And that that's not as advantageous. And that doesn't mean it's not a good cue. It's just you're going to get part of the way there and it's going to make an impact for that person. And you don't have to give them perfect form. But if you're looking to to do that, I guess my point is to say, don't stop there at cadence. You know, there are other things that you can do that we can stage some of these responses. And if somebody's subjectively saying that the cadence makes a difference, that's a great place to start. If somebody's saying that they don't really feel much of a difference and it just feels harder with cadence, it's probably because they didn't change the biomechanics and they probably didn't land close enough underneath of their body and it just feels hard for them. So you have to try a different cue with that person. Okay. So now we're going to get into some really uh, practical applications of these categories. But have you noticed that certain categories lead to certain injuries? And this is like a loaded question. But have you have you found that overstriders tend to have stress fractures in their femur? Do they have anterior knee pain? Do they have foot issues? Like what have you noticed with your categories and category categorization leading to pathology or pathology leading to certain category categorization? Right. So the the real answer is is like every answer. It depends, right? But I'll 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 go down that rabbit hole a little bit and and go a little further into it. What I think we can see with the categories is if you understand what the category does to the body, you can relate it to the type of injuries that we'll see. Some categories are easier than other to relate to specific injuries. An injury, like a category like overstriding, is kind of hard to relate it to a specific injury. But we can do the reverse math on it pretty well. So, what that means is let's say that somebody comes in with anterior knee pain and we know that we see that they're overstriding. What we're able to do is to explain to that athlete that's in front of us. What we're seeing is that you're landing far in front of your body, which increases the forces. And we notice that you're landing in a pretty extended knee posture. So this is going to reduce your use of your dynamic stabilizers, your muscles, and it's going to put more stress on the joint, that the passive structures that we see. And that can contribute to why you're having some more anterior knee pain symptoms. So I can go backwards and tell them maybe why that is. But if I took an overstrider, I couldn't quite say this person's going to have anterior knee pain. This person's going to have hip pain. That person's going to develop shin pain. Now, we could start to look at some other factors like the runner readiness assessment, and we could start to look at other things that are contributing factors. But what the reality is, is that the categories tell us if it's going to be high stress or stresses that are placed in incorrect areas. Mm -hmm. And then it's our job to figure out why there was a weak link. And that weak link is often the thing that gives way first. 
So there's some other factor, and I, this is a good point, Scott, right? Gate categories aren't the only thing that matters with a runner. We need to understand more about a runner just in their gate category. But I, I think the benefit of having those is that we get that gate piece because I think a lot of medical and fitness professionals are not looking at that aspect of it and they rely too heavily on mobility or motor control as like, well, you just had quad weakness and that's why you had anterior knee pain. It's like, no, you have quad weakness and this is your landing mechanics at initial contact. You're an overstrider. It comes down to, you know, it go, I'm going to get on that soapbox again, but it comes down to, again, stress versus capacity, right? Yes, right. if your quad was stronger, maybe it would deal with the, your, your, it would maybe mitigate the stresses that you're putting on it due to your poor landing mm -hmm. mechanics potentially better. But because you're landing a certain way and your quad is a certain way, you're maybe more likely to have x y and d type of problem so so i think it's like you said it's multifactorial no doubt for me what it's it's almost like that asterisk sign it's like we we get the opportunity to play detective here right so mm -hmm. we think we classify somebody as a as an overstrider let's say and we and we say we think that we can move loads away from a given point let's just say hypothetically it's a knee so we yep. feel that because this person is an overstrider that if, that I can redirect some of the load and force that's being excessively distributed in this person's case to their knee that can't handle it by manipulating that overstriding to try to get them to land closer because I feel personally that their overstriding mechanics are putting their knee in a position to absorb more more load at the present time than they're capable of. That's probably the way that I would I would probably spin it is that yeah. again it's 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 a way in which we can identify something we feel is contributing negatively to putting tissue under excessive load and if we feel and we know in the research based on certain things that certain cat, uh, uh, qualities of movement move that stress from one region to another or offload one region more than mm -hmm. another, then that's a strategy that I'd like to take 99.999 times out of 100, right? So, right. Um, you know, again, it's low hanging fruit, but it's using information you have at your disposal to try to get that runner on a path where their body is capable of dealing with the loads that they're putting through it based on their activity. Yeah, every decision has consequences. So what we're doing is we're making a clinical hypothesis and then we're making a decision about what we want to do. And then we have to consider when we do that, what are the consequences? So when we take that overstrider and increase their cadence and we know that we're putting more stress potentially on the posterior structures, well, what if that person has very limited capacity in the posterior chain? then that might not be an effective strategy to take with that person. And, and maybe, maybe that person needs quad strength more, you know? And maybe that person yeah. identify uh, or developed that overstriding mechanic to yeah. compensate for the weakness in the posterior structures potentially. Right. So that's why you have to realize that these are hypotheses and that you need to keep testing. And, and that's I think one of my problems, just not to interrupt, yeah. but that, along the same lines, that's one of my problems with um, people always talking about, I'm not going to mess with mechanics because that's their, that's their chosen way to run. Well, yeah. they're maybe choosing to run that way because they can't run another way because it's uncomfortable or they don't have the, it's, yes, it's their preferred because their other opp opportunities or, or options are, are skewed due to insufficiencies they have. Right. So, yeah. My three year, my four year old now, he shoots a basketball underhand because that's how he can do it. There's nobody in the NBA that shoots underhand because that's how they naturally learned how to shoot a basketball, right? right. It, it's it's the same thing. It's like a capacity. Like what what can we do? And the other thing to remember along those same lines, Scott, where I 100% agree with you is that we don't always get a memo when our movement changes. Our body adapts almost instantly to some of these changes and stress that our body is experiencing. And we're not all of a sudden like, oh, hey, guess what? You started landing a little bit further in front of your body because your calf got tired uh, from doing some sprints yesterday. So you're overstriding a little bit there. Uh, so if we're not getting that memo, and I think the people 
Um, I'm going to ruffle some feathers with this, but I think the people that don't want to mess with mechanics just aren't confident in their ability to be able to understand how to make adjustments. And they think that you have to get it right on the first time. And that's not the case. There's plenty of people that I give cues to and I'm like, oh, forget I said that. That does not look better. And they're like, yeah, that did not feel good. But that eventually I find one that they feel that aha moment where they're like, wow, is this what supposed, running is supposed to feel like? Why did nobody show me this earlier? And it's we're not always going to get an aha moment because there might be structural involvement from a mobility or motor control standpoint that somebody needs to adopt over time to this. But I, I think we really need to be willing to explore the mechanics because I always, you and I do this debate at the beginning of a course with everyone that attends a course. We're like, all right, if you see a pitcher that's dropping their elbow and throwing a ball that way, like, are you going to fix it? And they're like, yeah. All right. You see a runner over striding, you're going to fix it. And people are like, I don't know. Mm -hmm. And it's like, why not? Like, it's the same principle. Like, you're going to fix that because we know that every pitch could tear a UCL on a pitcher. Well, we know that any run could potentially exceed and, and cause the body to break down. It's, um, it's in my mind, the same thing there. But Yeah, it's, it's, it's very, very similar. No doubt. No doubt. So the, th the cool thing I like about, about your system, your Helix system, is that you know you got somebody marked up and they go for their run and you're assessing them and you know out pops the categories or the multitude of categories which is almost right. cheating right but at the same time i think i think you should take that and and utilize it in the sense that it could almost open your eyes to look in that direction a little bit right yeah it's a nudge it's a nudge it's a nudge and then and then the cool thing again is with your system based on the guardrails that we built in or you built in with regards to what the, what quantifies. And again, we know this is arbitrary. This is, there's no mm -hmm. per se, you know, strong research to back up the numbers in your system that kind of created that algorithm, right? There's some, there's some. Well, most there. of them are based off of like um, evidence-based data there for yeah. that. Looking but at your like normal. System, but your system is different than another three-dimensional system and they may not function all, the numbers you kind of get spit back out may not all be the same exact numbers, correct? Yeah, so there's there's different marker sets. There's different ways correct. that things are measured. The important thing is it's reliable. Uh, amongst itself that you're going to see the same thing again and again so Correct. that you can determine if there's a change. And, and, and the thing that I think is important to notice with your system too is that, you know, it's always going to, and it, it's always going to spit back a, 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 um, a category, right? right? So at no point will we ever find the perfect runner. And I think that's important to note too. It's a good, I think it's a good way to kind of end this is that yeah. there is no perfect runner. And every runner could have something to work on to improve, right? And yeah. I think that at some point it becomes minutia that you don't nearly have to worry about. But know that the cool thing also is, is that if you make a change to a certain cue or a certain speed or have somebody run in a certain type of environment, uphill, downhill, what does that do to their gait characteristics and the, and the, and the, and the machine, the tech, kind of helps you with that. And I think that's a cool, a cool thing to, to kind of appreciate. And that's what we've been saying about the courses are the same thing and the technology is the same thing. It's about accelerating your expertise. It's about, you know, Scott and I spent years working with runners and trying to figure it out and baffling runners with what we were babbling about, about their form and their mechanics. And we think we sound smart and they're like, I have no clue. I, f I feel like I should take up swimming after Scott told me what I'm doing wrong with running. So learn from our experience there. The fun thing, the next step and something I consider myself so lucky is that I learn every single time I treat a runner, I get to see how did that cue affect that mechanic? How did this affect there? And now I can get a lot of times people ask me, of course, like, how do you know what cue to do so quickly? Well, it's I've learned and every time I use the system, I'm able to say, OK, when I do this cue that when I do cadence, only one in five times is that actually changing the mechanics. Doug right? AI. Doug yeah, AI. yeah, yeah. That's a, uh, so machine that's learning. 
build into a deep learning there with it. Uh-huh. Um, but it's it's really fine. Now, um, before we end too, I didn't answer one of your questions and I did okay. want to just touch base on that real quick because you asked okay. me what to do for overstriding. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And yes, I yes, never yes. answered that. We got off on a fun tangent there. We so, did, we did. Um, maybe you can answer this one with me too. But I, I find um, there are the subcategories of overstrider and very like the computer i've tried to deviate from the algorithm what it's told me to and i typically wind up back at the queue that the computer told me to do um but i think it is important that there are multiple strategies that you can take with it if you don't have access and you're new to it cadence is a great tool i don't want to seem like i'm saying don't use cadence manipulation a five to ten percent changing somebody's cadence if they report subjectively that they feel less stress on their body while they run, that's a great place to start. Um, I also really like some drills. Uh, I like the wall drill for this, where I put the piece of tape on the ground and I give them some awareness of what they're doing while they're running to see how when they exchange on the wall drill, and their legs are up in the air that they're landing in front of their body in that position. So I think those are two things from a gait retraining standpoint, because I do really think there, we could probably go into more and maybe Scott, you can talk about some of this elements, but gait retraining is a critical factor for the overstrider knee drive. You can't just strengthen this person's knees or hips or ankles and say, they're going to stop overstriding. Um, and before you maybe talk about some of that stuff, there is one other thing I want to say, because this is a different opinion than I would have said probably two or three years ago. A major thing for overstriders is shoe wear. You have to address the shoe wear that somebody is in. I have done so many gait analysis now where I look at somebody in different shoes and I look at them in one pair of shoes versus the other. And there's a dramatic difference because of the technology in shoes now, because of the way that shoes are designed, there can be a pretty dramatic change in somebody's biomechanics. And because the shoes are so forgiving, they might not notice for four to six weeks and they won't attribute it to attribute it to the shoes. But the shoes 100% matter for these overstriding mechanics. And you absolutely need to get a gait analysis if you're switching shoes so that you understand how it impacts your mechanics. Here, here. Agree. Yeah. Anything else? Like, I mean, there are things like you're saying, uh, increasing quad strength, uh, I think can be helpful. Um, like anything else you, you like to do with overstrider, Scott? Yeah, I, I like to, uh, for me, it's a lot of cueing, a lot of, um, um, positioning of the limb. Um, I think, I think most overstriders spend too much time on the ground, um, mm-hmm. especially in the, in the rear side mechanic aspect of it. So I like to get my runners front side a lot quicker because I think the quicker they get front side, the quicker they hit the ground, the quicker they're off the ground and it creates that better cycle. Um, so I think, you know, people oftentimes stress, um, hip extension, hip extension, hip extension that doesn't necessarily hip extension should occur passively as momentum yes. kind of increases and as your speed increases and such, um, you shouldn't be necessarily pushing down into the ground for a long, prolonged period of time, time right. where you're extending your glutes and your and your plantar flexing. It should be a quick, a quick impulse into the ground and then your recoil to make another quick impulse to the ground because that's where your speed comes from. So for me, um, the biggest thing I, I talk about, whether it be cadence, but more, not necessarily cadence, but it's it's not how it's not what it but how. So it's not what their cadence is, it's how they get their cadence around. And like to yeah. what your point was before, is that you do change cadence and you see that their form doesn't change. It's because they've just adopted a quicker, similar pattern, right? Yeah. So you've got to kind of create, I like talking about creating a circle or a wheel, like you're riding a bicycle, kind of creating yeah. more of a cyclical or elliptical kind of motion to kind of get them on and off their ground a lot quicker. Yeah, I brought even my kid's scooter in to teach people sometimes how to do that. You like that one, huh? The skateboard and the scooter. I remember that. Uh Yeah. Yeah, that was a great one. Yeah, Mm -hmm. I was like that. So, 
Well, awesome. Scott, thank you. This was fun. Hopefully this uh, gives people some ideas and introduction of the categories and probably the most common one, the Overstrider, and check out some of the other podcasts. We, we talk about more of these things. And if you like this information, make sure you head over to the YouTube channel. We have a lot of these drills that we were talking about are on the Run DNA YouTube channel, as well as some of the exercises. So head over there or head over to RunDNA.com. Sign up for a newsletter to make sure you're learning about uh, our courses and some of the events and things that we have going on. Thanks for listening and happy, healthy running. Bye, everyone. Like what you hear? Leave a review of the show wherever you listen and don't forget to subscribe so you never miss an episode. Run DNA helps runners and running specialists through education and technology to identify each runner's unique injury profile to avoid setbacks and maximize results. The Run DNA podcast is produced by Ace Running LLC. The Run DNA podcast is intended for educational purposes only. No clinical decision making should be based solely on one source. While care is taken to ensure accuracy, factual errors can occur. Always seek the guidance of qualified medical professionals before making healthcare decisions. Find us online at rundna.com.